Hello again, Joe Huff finds at First Baptist. Nice to see you. As you know, we finished uh, our study in uh, First and Second Timothy last week, and today we move into the last of the pastoral epistles. The last, as they're in our Bible, uh, actually, Titus was written in between First and Second Timothy, <clears throat> and um, uh, so when we came out of Second Timothy just now, that was actually Paul's last letter of the many that he wrote. And as you know, he was martyred there in Rome by Nero. And what you sense in these letters, uh, again, is not just doctrine and the application of doctrine, but it's uh, instruction to these young uh, pastors who now will have to take the march. Uh, and again, I think of the, the song Onward Christian Soldiers that's just so typical of what's happening here in these particular studies. And so these Christian soldiers are having to march forward with all the work that Paul had uh, planted and begun. And uh, he just uh, wanting to be sure that uh, you know everything continues as it's been and that the dedication, the uh, ability to resist all of the temptations, the false teachings and uh, false doctrines that are being propagated uh, Judaism being forced upon these new Christians, uh, severe persecutions. Paul knows it's going to be a tough road, and it still is, still is as we know, uh, watching the news every day. We're living in, in troubled times, and it's all biblical, isn't it? <clears throat> these are these are letters are our personal sentiment and 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 practical encouragement from Paul. Um, you know that. Uh, <clears throat> Timothy was already, by virtue of his mother and grandmother, was already steeped in the Jewish traditions when Paul met him. But that's not the case with Titus. Titus is a Gentile, and Paul is the one who converts him and brings him to Christianity. Uh, <clears throat> Titus did a lot for Paul, as, of course, Timothy had done. Uh, he left uh, Titus in Corinth. And uh, when things were really difficult in that church, you, you know that the church in uh, Corinth was one of the most troubled that, that Paul had to deal with. And he left Titus, so that tells you that he had a lot of trust in Titus. And he left him there, and Titus was the one who gave the report back, letting Paul know that uh, some, some good had been done by his letters and his preachings to the Corinthians. <clears throat> we see that Titus also was eventually sent to Dalmatia. And I don't know about you, but I had heard that, that term, and, and yet I didn't really know where it was until I did some study. And it turns out that it's modern-day Croatia. And <clears throat> if you've ever watched some of the travel shows or perhaps made the travels uh, to the Aegean Sea and the Greek Isles yourself, you know that it's, it's just beautiful country uh, around Croatia and Bosnia and all those, those countries over there. Uh, and so he left Titus there to do a lot of work. But the main place that the Bible tells us about what uh, Titus did was in the island of Crete, which was south of Greece and southwest of Turkey. And uh, so Titus started uh, the churches there in Crete. And uh, there's a person, let me turn and read that to you because it's too difficult for me to try and say it on my own, but there was a 6th century B.C. philosopher named Epimenides, and he was born in Crete, and he was a writer, and he describes some of his people there in Crete, the Cretans, uh, and he attacked them uh, for being lazy uh, uh, about some things uh, regarding some of the false gods that they were worshiping there. Uh, he called them evil beasts and gluttons, and so uh, Crete kind of had a bad reputation. And so you can imagine the, the job that Paul left Titus to do there was very challenging. But again, Timothy and Titus are in our scriptures because uh, they were dedicated men, uh, mostly younger men, uh, who had to take the banner of Christianity and march forward with it. Uh, so this letter we're about to move into, Titus, you'll want to turn to the first chapter and uh, we'll start out in verse 1. Uh, was written again between the first and second uh, letters that Paul had written to Timothy. Uh, look with me then um, at Titus chapter 1, verse 1, and here we get the typical Pauline uh, 
a way to introduce a, a letter. And he says, Paul, I, I, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, I don't want to chop these up too much, but I'd like to insert comments for you. Uh, you remember that he had to defend his apostleship all the time, so it's not uncommon for Paul to identify himself each time as an apostle. And then he, he mentions that name that we get from Paul. Uh, it's so familiar to us today, we just take it for granted, but he says, Jesus Christ. Or we can reverse that, Christ Jesus. We got that combination of titles and name for Jesus from Paul. So he says he's a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect. Now, who is God's elect? Well, I think in the original intent it was meant to describe Israel. But I believe uh, here and many times in the Bible it's really speaking of those of us who've given ourselves to Christ. And he's just calling us God's elect, so it's not just limited to Israel. And he goes on to say, and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So you're seeing the same themes here in one or two lessons we will have in this very brief uh, book of Titus. And he talks about knowledge and truth and godliness. And we've mentioned those uh, for several weeks, so I won't belabor it today. Verse 2 he says, in the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Of course, what's key there, I think, is he's talking about that um, the Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are, are from the beginning. Uh, they were there when the creation took place. And then he uses that word that's so vital to all of we Christians, and that's hope. And he's mentioning here what that hope is, eternal life. And so he's just uh, kicking the letter off here. This is, again, a new letter now that we're into. Uh, I've mentioned this before. I trust you know this, but let me uh, share with you again. All of Paul's letters, again, 13 are canonized in our Bible, and there were some extras lost. All of them were written to believers. Sometimes I don't think we really remember or realize that. They were all written to believers. So Paul's purpose was primarily for the development of, of new Christians, uh, converts, and planting churches. Of course, he was the, the great uh, uh, spreading of new churches and uh, all of that. <coughs> uh, I'm looking for a word that skips me, but um, missionary. I just couldn't think of the word missionary. But um, he always wrote these letters to his believers to encourage them, to instruct them, and so forth. Um, and he mentions there that, that we can trust God's word because God is incapable of lying. Um, what uh, we learn about Crete is it's just a small island there below um, uh, Greece, and it was uh, an island in these days that we're reading about uh, where a lot of mercenary soldiers and traders lived, uh, and, and it was all business that was going on with the Roman Empire. Uh, we'll move on to verse 3, and Paul says, In his own time he has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God our Savior. So again, we're getting some of the Trinity, uh, as he mentions here, about who, who Christ is. And what is he talking about when he says, In his own time he has revealed? I've mentioned this before, but the Bible, uh, I think many of us know this, and sometimes a lot of us don't, so let me, let me cover it again. The Bible is a progressive revelation, and sometimes people don't really understand, what is that? What do you mean? Well, if you think about it, again, the Bible starts in Genesis, and that's the beginning, and it goes through all 66 books to the last revelation, which is the book called Revelation and the End Times. And uh, it's just a progressive revelation. We have Old Testament, we have New Testament. We have, uh, in the New Testament, we have uh, a new God revealing Himself to the Gentiles through the efforts of Paul and the birth uh, of Christ. And, and so uh, it's everything in the Bible is God revealing Himself a little along uh, according to history and what man's able to understand at the time and what God's message at the time is. So that's what, what he means there when he says, in his own time he has revealed. And then again Paul says, uh, which I was entrusted with. So he, he truly has the authority to say these things to these, these young pastors. Um, you may remember in many of Paul's writings he refers to God's plan 
which relates to what he has said here, calling it a mystery. Well, uh, again, many times that was just talking about the foundations of the world and how God reveals himself along and about how he takes this message to the whole world, not just the Jews and Israel, but takes it to the Gentiles and the whole world. That's all God revealing his plan, which was from the beginning. He had that plan all along. We go to verses 4 and 5, and it says, To Titus. So here's Paul again uh, telling us who's writing this and who it's addressed to. And he, like he did with Timothy, he refers to him as a son. And I'm sure to, to Paul, they were a, a young son. He calls Titus my true son in our common faith. And then here's more typical Pauline uh, start to a letter. And he says, Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Again, part of the triune God. And you probably know this as well, but when the Bible tells us the word grace, that is, that is uh, typically a, a word that was common to Gentiles. And when he says peace, that was a word that meant more to Jews. And of course, grace uh, refers to unearned blessings. And peace is just a way of saying uh, that our spirit is at rest with God despite all the turbulence that's going on in the world. He's just wishing grace and unmerited favor from God to Titus and peace, a peaceful heart in this turbulent world. And uh, we know the world that these young pastors were, were facing was very turbulent. Uh, their lives depended on it. We move on in verse 5 and Paul says, the reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone and as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. Uh, apparently Paul and Titus had done several things together by the time he writes this letter. And one of those was they apparently had been to Crete at some point uh, in their missionary work together and had not finished what Paul felt that needed to be completed. And so he's now uh, telling uh, Titus that we need to finish that up, Titus, and that's what uh, your charter is here now is to do that. And apparently it was something that included appointing elders in each town in these churches. So there's obviously a number of churches in this little small island. Uh, we, we move on to verses 10 and 11, and Paul says, For there are many rebellious people. That gets back to what that Epimenides apparently was saying about the Cretans. Full of empty talk, he says, and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. Uh, again, this is just typical uh, language from Paul in these letters. It's the Judaizers who <coughs> are trying to adhere to <coughs> the Jewish rituals and laws uh, that would be required of these young Christians. And Paul says that's, that's just not necessary, um, including such things as circumcision. And in fact, Titus was an uncircumcised Jew, uh, Gentile. <clears throat> so he talks here again, as he did in the last two of the pastorals, he talks here again about empty talk and deception. We mentioned that about just idle chatter and gossip that, are, that can be so harmful in, in any church. And apparently it was just crippling these new young churches. We move on then to verse 11 and it says, it is necessary to silence them. That was also in the letter to Titus. You can't allow that to go on, Paul says, and it applies again even to today in churches. There are people, uh, sometimes unintentionally, uh, other times intentionally, that uh, try to say things harmful that can really cause harm to the congregation, sometimes to the staff in a church, and tear churches apart. We've even seen some of that in our own area uh, in years past. Paul goes on to say they are ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. So what's apparently happening there is these troublemakers and these Judaizers are trying to get some financial gain out of some of the things they're telling these young Christians that they should be doing. <clears throat> they're trying to make money off of them. Now I've got some scripture readings I want to stop and read to you here now. The first one, I'll just read uh, in no particular order. I've got three, uh, and I'm reading here from Acts 15, chap uh, chapter 15, verse 1. You don't have to get your Bibles uh, turned to that. Just follow with me if you will. <clears throat> and Paul is 
is, uh, of course, the key player in a lot of these things in Acts. It's kind of a history book in our New Testament. And it says, Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, quote, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. So you see, in a lot of these towns, that's the message that these Judaizers are, are saying. Now, you know, I try to be fair about uh, sometimes uh, people like the Sanhedrin or these Judaizers and all. I mean, in all honesty, I, uh, some of them may have had uh, malice in heart. But I think a lot of them just were trying to be faithful to the, the, the religion that they had, and they felt that some of these things uh, that these new Christians were doing in their mind uh, from strict Judaism uh, just, you know, was wrong. And so they were trying to defend it. But Paul knows from the enlightenment that he's been given and the challenge and charter that he's been given as an apostle from Christ himself that uh, this message is for Christians taking the message to the Gentiles uh, and uh, even beyond the, the Jews and the foundations of the religion. And so there you see in Acts. Now we'll move on and we'll look at Galatians, of course, another letter from Paul, chapter 2, verse 12, and it says, well, I'm actually going to read you th three verses. Uh, we're in chapter 2 of Galatians, and it says, but when Cephas, of course, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him. This is Paul. I opposed Peter to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. So, of course, James was back in Jerusalem, and he was still a Jew among Jews, and one of the pillars of the church there in Jerusalem. And so uh, he's calling uh, Peter a, a, a hypocrite because uh, when he's with the Jews, he's acting Jewish, and when he's with these Gentiles, he's acting Gentile. He goes on to say, however, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself. So see, he's saying it's hypocrisy, because he feared those from the circ circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Peter in front of everyone, quote, If you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? So that's a pretty good statement in, in our point here. And then there's a final one we've got in Philippians. And I believe I've got that marked over here too, but I apparently lost my mark, but I can find it quickly. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, and it says, <clears throat> and of course written by Paul uh, to the Philippian church, watch out for dogs, watch out for evil workers, watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who serve by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. So it's just this consistent message that Paul is preaching to these co-workers in these efforts in launching these churches. We don't have to be Jews and follow Jewish traditions to be Christians. Uh, okay, let's see where we were here. So we were back to uh, verse 11. It says, it is necessary to silence them. So he's saying you can't, you can't muddle around with these folks doing these things. They're ruining entire households. Uh, so apparently, you know, a lot of people uh, practice their faith a as a family, and it was affecting entire families, uh, leading them away purposely. Verse 12 through 14 says, One of their very own prophets, and this gets back to that, that man uh, Epimenides, says, One of their very own prophets said, Cre Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, rebuke them sharply, Titus, so that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of people who reject the truth. We've all been told when we do such things as rebuke, uh, which is a strong word, that uh, Paul, who's usually telling us that, his purpose is always for correction and redemption. It's not to to be uh, cruel to anyone, but it's a redemptive purpose. We move on to our last couple of verses today. Verse 15, it says, To the pure, everything is pure. 
But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. Now we could look again at some more scripture in the Old Testament, Matthew chapter 23, uh, verse 25 and 26. And if we did, we'd see there where Jesus is speaking and he quotes, uh, woe to the hypocrites. So uh, Jesus is, is, is preaching the same message that Paul's preaching here uh, later is uh, got to watch out for the hypocrites who say one thing and live another. <clears throat> Final verse, verse 16 says, they claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. And I guess if we wanted to single out one verse in our lesson today, that might be it. They claim to know God, but they deny Him by their works. In other words, do we walk the walk and talk the talk, or do we just talk the talk? Last sentence says, they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. Uh, so they believe, I think we could say, they believe in their their own self-righteousness by their own self-effort. Uh, so let me just uh, close with a couple of questions here to get us to finalize our thinking in this brief lesson we've got. How should viewing the gospel as a sacred trust impact a believer? How should uh, viewing the gospel as a sacred trust impact a believer's life? Well, we should stand on it. Don't you think? We should stand on it. If it's sacred, if it's God's Word, it's truth, then we should stand on it. And we've talked for several weeks here about uh, New Age uh, religion, uh, about asceticism and Gnosticism and uh, Christianity light and all these things that continue to plague uh, believers in the world today. And uh, in my simple terms, it's just trying to preach that anything goes and that's not much of a religion to stand on. And what Paul is saying here is if the gospel is sacred, then we should stand on it and we should act on it and we should believe it and live it in our lives. Here's another question. Why was it necessary for Titus to complete the work that Paul had begun? And, and how does that affect you and I today? Well, we're all inheritors of our faith. Our parents and grandparents and numerous generations now, back for 2,000 years, uh, have been practicing this faith called Christianity. And um, so someone began it. People like uh, Paul and Titus and, and Timothy and others. And we have inherited it and it's our responsibility to pick up as he's admonishing Titus to finish the work they had done in Crete. The same challenge is ours. And we need to continue what the mission is for the church and to hold it responsibly and uh, sincerely and seriously and, and march on Christian soldiers. Uh, I have a note here as I, I conclude. It says that Paul saw the need to teach Titus how to deal with heresies within the church. It goes on again today and uh, we have to be careful to uh, identify it and to correct it uh, with a redemptive purpose but not allow it to destroy the church. Uh, great having you with us. We have, I think, one more lesson in Titus, and then we move on to Ephesians, a really good study. Uh, one of the bigger churches, uh, Ephesus, you remember, is where a lot took place. It was uh, where uh, one of the big uh, false god re uh, religions was housed. We'll talk about that again. It's where uh, the Apostle John is thought to have lived with Christ's mother Mary for some years. Uh, after the crucifixion. Uh, a lot took place in Ephesus. It's an important church and it'll be a good study and I hope you'll be with us. God bless you. See you next week.